I'll just put in like some kind of weird B-roll in, in place of you while you're frozen. What's up, everybody? Jason and Joe here from Taste Like Music. And today we are joined by a special guest. We have Michael Ralt on the program today, coming to us out from in uh, California, is it? Yeah, I'm in Landers, California right now, around Joshua Tree. So longtime uh, enthusiasts of this channel will possibly remember that I had one of Michael's records in my albums of the year, in my top five for 2018, his album, A New Day Tonight. Uh, which I absolutely love. I think it's a fantastic record. If you haven't checked it out yet, go do so. Uh, but he's got another one on the way. So I thought this would be a good time to have him on, maybe talk a bit about it quickly before we get into the other topic at hand. Uh, so yeah, the new record, uh, self-titled, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Self-titled. Uh, that'll be out uh, in June. Uh, yeah, exactly. June 10th, it's going to come out. We will uh, also put links below to your new video, which is really cool. And uh, wherever people can pre-order the record, we'll, we'll send them there. Uh, but the topic at hand today, uh, we are getting into some deep 70s obscure tracks. We talked about this briefly through texting. We didn't really define obscure, so I don't know how deep you're going. I don't know how deep Joe, Joe is going, but... When I put together the list, it's a very... Uh loosely defined term one person's obscure won't necessarily be someone else's obscure so i don't exactly know if my list even adheres to the rules the parameters that i set out for this but we'll just uh hopefully we hopefully we all interpreted it somewhat uh similarly yeah and i'm sure we'll have the uh, the uh, that's not even obscure comment uh coming yeah from exactly that from somebody for sure regardless of how deep we go we'll do one at a time uh joe do you want to kick us off Okay, well, I'll start with my most obscure song, just to set the mood here. And this is a band I didn't know much about until somebody in our comment section just randomly happened to mention it, and I checked it out. It is a prog band called Nectar, N-E-K-T-A-R. And um, I'd never heard anything from them before, but he, he said to check out this album, Recycled. And so the song I'm bringing forth is Recycled. It's the entire first half of the album. It's this really kind of cool sci-fi 70s prog. It's 17 minutes long. If you listen to it on streaming, it's, you know, they, they break it up into five or six little parts. So you don't have to listen to the whole thing, but, you know, to get the full experience, you got to listen, you got to power through the whole thing. Uh, but I thought it did a really cool job of setting a futuristic mood and like replicating this environment of you know some kind of science fiction factory. Uh, just a, a cool, interesting, different sounding uh, prog release that kind of strays outside the heavy hitters of Genesis and Yes and, and whatever else, but a little more science fiction-y type. Uh, so that is my song, Recycled by Nectar. Uh, you want to go next? Sure, me? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that seems extremely obscure from my perspective, although maybe I'm just not, haven't dug deeply enough into the world of Prague, but I do like Prague and that sounds cool. Um, my, my first track that came to mind when I put together this list was a, a song called Full Moon by Mitch Margot. Um, Mitch Margot is, <clears throat> along with his brothers, at least one of his brothers, saying uh, the the line the in the jungle the lion sleeps tonight whatever that song is called in the 50s uh, or maybe those early 60s i don't that's not my song so i don't know much about it but i do know that that's what they're most famous for um but i think he like died recently um this song actually just as of recently showed up on spotify but it was up until recently only available on youtube from what i could tell and other than youtube it was like available through a cd baby account that i think maybe his kid runs or something who was like ma making some home pressed cds of his dad's like later catalog um i believe the song comes from the 70s uh, i looked it up i think i think it does and it's a uh, it's just really cool i'm not sure if it's home recorded because a lot of his stuff from like a lot of his 70s era stuff um seems to have come from the 70s and it was home recorded i think lots of it has drum machines this is actually full band and it has like a kind of goes between like a new orleans 
trombone solo at one point and then like really cool like weird futuristic breakdowns with like some arpeggiating synths and stuff it's just really it's also very pop with really like, really beautiful harmonies which i guess you'd expect from people who sang uh their big hit when they were like 16 or whatever and were amazing singers since they were little kids um i'm not sure if his brothers are involved in this track but uh this one song full moon by mitch margo is a really great pop song and a cool piece of I think home recorded history. There's very little information on it on the internet, but I, I would highly recommend checking it out. All right, cool. Yeah, I've never heard of that. So that'll be fun to check out. I will also be making a playlist and dropping it in the video description as well for people to uh, take a listen to all of these songs. Uh, my first pick, I like Joe, I'm also going Prague. This is my only Prague selection of the five, but uh, this is a band called England and the song is called Paraphernalia. Um, it's on the 1977 album Garden Shed. And, you know, I can't, they, this band was kind of doomed from the start. I think the founding member, uh, Mark Ibbotson, quit right after their showcase gig that got them signed. So he's not even on the debut record. Um, you know, 77 is a late start for a prog band. Prog was already going out of fashion. Punk was taking over. Um, but this song is really cool. It's kind of like a mix between Genesis and Yes, probably a little more Genesis-y, but it's also like kind of poppy. It's a really cool, upbeat, uh, melodic track. It's only four minutes, so it's not like a long epic prog piece. Uh, the bass on it is really cool, kind of bouncy and buoyant. Um, just really cool. Like for, for prog, it is very, very easy listening and uh, kind of an earworm. The other notable thing about this band that they're kind of known for is that their keyboard player had a Mellotron that he sawed in half and he had it housed in like two separate units to make it easier to uh, carry around to gigs. So uh, kind of <laughs> bizarre, but uh, very cool. That sounds rad. Right, well, um, now people in the know are gonna know this next artist, but I rarely miss a chance to talk about him and we'll be talking about him a lot more on the channel soon. So I got to bust out a Gene Clark tune. They're pretty much all obscure because uh, pretty much every one of his albums failed spectacularly. But I will bust out in a misty morning from the unknown here in America anyway, Roadmaster album. Although it was a big hit in the Netherlands, I hear. It's a very personal song that I really like the lyrics, the um, juxtaposition. He's talking about just being on a city street. The sky, you know, opened up, it rained. He talks about the, the street being wet, a, a cop car passing by, and really just sort of generic, like little things that sparks his imagination to think back on you know, a failed relationship or anything. And just the way he describes like this just scene in a city uh, is just really beautiful. Uh, he's, you know, he's got his trembling vocals and he's just backed by a, just a guitar, some strings, and um, which is a really simple, sweet song. Clarence White, who we love here on this channel, um, and members of the Flying Burrito Brothers were his backing band, Sneaky Pete Klein and uh, Chris Atheridge. A song that you would hear and you couldn't believe like it wasn't a hit or a single or something because it's just so perfect. Um, but that sort of was the life of Gene Clark. So. He's the best. Should I just jump into my to my one now? Yeah, go for it. My next choice. Um, cool. Uh, I think that uh, my next one I'm gonna go with is um, an Ian Matthews song, kind of in a similar vein as Gene Clark, in the sense that uh, Ian Matthews is from Fairport Convention, so another guy who got his start in like a sort of somewhat folky folk rock band in the '60s. Um, who went on to do somewhat obscure, I think slightly even more obscure than Gene Clark, <laughs> and even managed to have even less success. But uh, Ian Matthews has some great solo records and some great solo tunes. His album, Stealing Home, which came out in 1978, is a real classic. Uh, the tune that I'm choosing is a song called Gimme an Inch. It's really cool, like, it's yacht rocky, I guess, a little bit. Uh, it's something that me and my girlfriend like to call coke folk in our own self uh, described genre. That's it, you know, it's just that era of folky musicians with that sort of as their roots making music that seems somewhat sort of oddly club oriented. Like it's got like heavy groove and it's like 
almost, you know, it's kind of in that too slow to disco range. Um, this song's got just a really great band, really cool drum sounds, uh, great performance in general, sexually suggestive, suggestive lyric, uh, which is always nice. And uh, it's just a great track. And the album is great too. Um, there's a few other really good tunes on the album as well, but Give Me an Inch, I believe is the kickoff tune and has always been my favorite. So that's the one I'm gonna go with. Cool, cool. All right. I know a little Ian Matthews. I don't really, I'm not intimately familiar. I'm more aware of him. So that'll be another cool one to check out. Uh, my next pick is a song called Absolutely Free, Absolutely Beautiful by a band called Magic, not the magic with an exclamation point that had a hit a few years ago. This band from the early 70s, they're from Lansing, Michigan. They moved to Miami. They were on a label there, made a record. Then they moved back to Michigan and ended up on a label called Rare Earth, which was a subsidiary of Motown. But they are not a R&B band or a soul group or anything like that. Uh, more of like a folky country rock, maybe a little soul in there a, a bit. But um, so they make this record, self-titled record on a subsidiary of Motown. Stevie Wonder apparently plays keys on some of this record, but I have no idea which tracks. I doesn't sound like he's playing keys on this track, um, but Paul Franklin is playing pedal steel on it. He's a pedal steel legend. Uh, just a really, really cool track. Really gorgeous, beautiful string arrangement. Um, just a, yeah, a really cool relic of the early 70s. And uh, it's got that great pedal steel that I always gravitate towards. All right, my next selection is gonna be a cover from a famous guitarist that sort of disappeared off the face of the earth uh, after Falling out of favor with Funkadelic, Eddie Hazel went on to make one solo record, which was out of print forever. Uh, but on this record, he does um, probably his signature song is a cover of California Dreaming, the pop standard from Mamas and Papas. And he just puts his funk rock um, you know, signature on this. Just incredible cascading, reverb heavy guitar lines. It's really cool slap bass going on in the, in the background and some funky piano. It's mostly instrumental, but he also sings, you know, some of the lyrics on it. And he, he has a great voice, and it is such a shame that he didn't do more. Uh, so talented. And I just think it's amazing how transformed the song becomes, but still has those recognizable elements. Uh, just a, a really cool, amazing cover uh, from Eddie Hazel. Sweet. Um, so I'll jump in here. Um, I, my next one I'm going to go with is this uh, power pop tune. We haven't really covered a ton of power pop stuff yet. Um, this is from 1978 by a band called the Paley Brothers. Uh, the song is called You're the Best. And it's just a really fun pop song. It's got great chord changes, um, kind of gets like a little bit more advanced than the absolute straightest pop song ever, but um, also has a little bit of a Beach Boys parody thing going on where they kind of do some like really cliche sort of Beach Boy, like early Beach Boys style back and vocal that like chanting type things uh, that would make you feel like you're listening to like an early Beach Boys surfy kind of record, which I always like uh, Beach Boys parodies. I guess it got um, implanted in my mind after initially, you know, as a teenager noticing the Beatles doing it on back in the USSR and just the idea of taking really noticeable Beach Boys things, who I also love, it's not out of any meanness, but, and just uh, parodying their very recognizable sound is always really fun to me. Um, I'm like literally just now looking at this band and finding out that they apparently worked with Jimmy Iovine. I don't know if he actually produced this and they also like have some tie in with the Ramones. So there's a lot more to this story than I actually even knew leading into choosing it but it's a great song i guess they also worked with phil Spector at some point in time i don't exactly apparently that was what led to their breaking up and this is all stuff that i this band i don't know if this song is on any like mainstream streaming services i think it might only be on youtube as well that's where i found it um but it's a great song apparently these guys actually had some amount of success in their lives that i was partially uh, derailed by the stress of working with Phil Spector leading to the breakup of their band. <laughs> but it's a cool track, so I, I would highly recommend it. Uh, I'll put it on my top five, why not? Here we go. Very cool. I've been uh, digging into a lot of power pop lately and getting to some like deeper bands. I actually had a little listening party on our Discord with some people listening to some like 
obscure power pop and through all of my looking at obscure power pop in the last couple of weeks i did not even see that name come up so i mean it also who knows like what you would define as power pop it's like maybe you know power pop sometimes is like a really like proto punk thing and then other times it's like more sort of like post Beatles, I feel. Sometimes people classify like those two different things. And then there's the weird, this is maybe in the gray area between being like proto-punk, but I guess there's a Ramones tie-in. So maybe it really, I think it does apply, a, a, a fully meet the prerequisite needs to be a power pop song. <laughs> All right, cool. My next pick is a song called My Only Son by Duncan Brown. Uh, Duncan Brown had a minor UK hit, the song called Journey from the same record. Uh, he did it on top of the pops. So some people in the UK may remember him. He was more well known for going on after this record to form a band called Metro. And Metro did the original version of a song called Criminal World, which David Bowie ended up covering on Let's Dance. So yeah, he had this uh, minor hit on this record, but I, I like this song a little better. It's uh, kind of folky. He plays a nylon string guitar, finger picked. He has a really lovely voice. It kind of sounds to me like his lower register at least sounds a little bit like a, a slightly more aged McCartney. It's like 90s McCartney is kind of what he sounds like. Um, just a really pretty song. Uh, just that good like 70s singer songwriter folk that I love. So uh, really good one. My Only Son by Duncan Brown. Uh, this artist had a very minor hit early 70s with a song called Avenging Annie. And this guy named Andy Pratt recently just kind of accidentally discovered him. And his third album, Resolution, is this bizarre mix of like power pop, hard rock, disco. And it ends up, uh, the song, If You Could See Yourself Through My Eyes, it's weird. It's like a carbon copy 30 years previous of like the Scissor Sisters. Like it's got that high falsetto vocals. Uh, they got, I think, one of like the Bee Gees producers or some disco producer to help him out with this one, uh, his album Resolution. And it's just filled with these great little pop uh, disco, you know, glam mashups. Okay, cool. Uh, which one did I say I was going to do next? I was going to do this one. This one definitely has a bit of a cult following to it. There's actually a cool um, little animated special and interview with the guy. It's actually, it's kind of sad, um, but it definitely has a bit of a following and also just barely creeps into the 1970s list. I almost didn't consider it because it sounds like a 1960s recording and it was actually released in 1970. For all I know, it was recorded in 1969, but I had to exclude another song that <laughs> fell onto the 1980 cutoff. So this one made it in. Um, it's I Knew You Were, the, If I Knew You Were the One by Richard Twice. It's a really cool track. It has a crazy story. Uh, you should watch the video if you want to get the full breakdown of it. But to summarize, I hope I'm not giving any spoilers here, but to summarize his story, he is this guy, he wasn't a musician. He lived in LA. He got in a motorcycle accident. He had his friend who he was riding on the back of the motorcycle with somebody who they both got thrown from the motorcycle. The guy died, the other guy. Richard twice lost his leg, was amputated. And then while he was recovering from that, he taught himself how to play guitar and started writing songs. Wrote this song as one of the few he'd written so far in his very young musical life. I guess living in LA, uh, there's, you know, connections and things going on in the world. So he managed to somehow get connected with somebody who hooked him up with a recording session and a record label tryout. And he was backed up by the Wrecking Crew on this track. And then it's like really cool psychedelic stuff. It's like, it's got this crazy like echoing flute or something like that going through it. And it, like, there's these bridges where it's just like this droning folky vocal, or uh, it's like some of the verses are like, just like, droning folky vocal with like a break beat, like kick and snare and like nothing else. And then these like echoing flutes, like it's just such a perfect sample. I'm sure it's been sampled by somebody. Um, and yeah, and then basically I guess he ended up kind of flopping at his uh, record label tryout. They made the recording, then they did this kind of showcase for like mostly industry people, which I guess was par for the course back in those days to get your like full out deal. And I guess he just like the mic wasn't on and he was nervous and he was uncomfortable because of his newly amputated leg. 
And he never made music again, basically, after he didn't get the record deal. And he went into like woodworking or something like that. But the song is really special and interesting. And it has this crazy story uh, attached to it. And so that that's uh, my, my choice for this go round. That sounds really cool. Definitely going to check that one out. Uh, my next pick is a song called One More Chance to Run by a band called British Lions. This is a band that is uh, descended from Mott the Hoople. Basically, when Mott the Hoople broke up, Mick Ronson and Ian Hunter left the band. They brought in new guys, Ray Major and uh, Nigel Benjamin, to replace them. They made two records. They dropped the Hoople from their name. They, they released two records just as Mott. And then they got rid of Nigel Benjamin and got another new singer and changed their name again to British Lions. Uh, they brought in the singer John Fiddler, who had previously been the singer in a band called Medicine Head. And later on in the 80s, he would uh, sing for a band called Box of Frogs, which was essentially the Yardbirds minus all of the guitar heroes from the Yardbirds. Uh, but anyways, this song, really cool. It's got this really awesome opening guitar riff, just chugging, killer guitar tone. It's really bombastic, over the top. This one is another song that's kind of power poppy, uh, but all the really poppy melodies are balanced out nicely with just a little bit of darkness and a little bit of heaviness. And it's kind of weird, but I just think it's a really awesome, catchy tune from uh, 1978, I believe. All right, my pick, uh, not that obscure probably. Uh, you guys have out obscured me, but I'm gonna go with Fanny. Uh, Charity Ball is my pick. Yes, it charted in 71. I believe, but it doesn't matter. Fanny deserves a little more credit, a little more press uh, for being a pioneering all-female rock group. And this song is a hoot, underpinned by the strong group vocals, uh, fun honky-tonk piano, great bass groove, uh, killer solo on the end even, all within like two minutes. So it's just a jam-packed, compact, little uh, pop, rock, bluesy number and uh really dig it so charity ball fanny is my favorite. i have a few options of what i could do for the last tune but i'm gonna just stick with i think this is the most obscure of the options that i have um similar to my last one it's another one from the very early 70s i think it's say in 71 um it's a song called daybreak by joan bing um it's another sort of private press folky pop folk sort of thing, kind of coming out of the Simon and Garfunkel vibe, even with the title of the band being just two people's names. It's a really cool track. It has really great um, arrangement, great melody. It's, it's just great, it's great songwriting, great harmony performance, again, a la Simon and Garfunkel. It's got some sort of jazzy piano stuff going on, which adds a cool flavor to it. Um, and it also is, the version that I'm looking on on YouTube right now is uploaded by Bing Bingham, which is also a crazy name, but I think it's Bing now all grown up and sharing his music that I guess he says initially there was only like 1500 pressed to sell at shows with like, I think of white label that, you know, private press stuff that are extremely expensive. Now it was then reissued through the big pink music label and it's going to be released through Mapache records sometime soon he says so but the uh, that tune i think has gained a little bit of popularity on the internet so for some people might not really be as obscure as some things but extremely obscure at the time and it was a great track yeah that's a good point about i there's like fewer and fewer things from the 70s that are still considered obscure because there's so many reissues now and there's all these documentaries and like 20 years it'll ago, only be obscure for like five minutes too i mean i feel like i've found things that no one knew about like or very few people knew about for like half a year or a year and then like I've I actually excluded some songs that at the time that I found them I was like this is the jam and no one knows it and then it gets like reissued by Light in the Attic or something and then everybody knows it and it's too obvious to bring up in this although also still great stuff and they're a great label and I'm not complaining <laughs> but it is it can't stay obscure forever in this day and it's just good it's nice that all these people get their due eventually all right well this next one I've got is one that's new to me I went kind of digging today for some obscure stuff and this one really caught my ear and I'm pretty excited about it. I don't know exactly how obscure it is, um, but it is uh, Keith Cross and Peter Ross, uh, the rhyming name duo. <laughs> the song is called Dead Salute, uh, but the whole record is really, really cool. Uh, the record's called Bored Civilians. Keith Cross was in a prog band called T2, 
which is uh, a little well known. If, if you know Prague, you might know of them. Uh, Peter Ross was in a band called Hookfoot, which I don't really know anything about. Um, but this record is kind of like a British take on the Laurel Canyon sound. It came out in 72. There's some really interesting people on it. Nick Lowe plays on it. D. Murray plays on it as well. Although, again, it's a, one of those cases. There's another bass player listed, and I don't know who plays on which tracks. So D. Murray may not be on this uh, particular song. Uh, but it sounds fantastic. It's super well produced. Um, a lot of times you dig through like obscure stuff and you're like, yeah, that's really cool, but it doesn't sound good. So I can see why it stayed obscure and didn't like catch fire on the radio. This one, though, I don't know what held this back or, or what the story is with it, but because it sounds fantastic. Um, it's amazingly well sung. Great acoustic guitar, just playing like some uh, slide on the acoustic harmonica just sounds really, really cool. I love it. I can't wait to dig into this record more and just like listen to it over and over again. Uh, really psyched about this discovery this morning. I'm looking forward to checking that one out. So there you go. Those are our picks for some obscure 70s gems. Hopefully you check them out. And after you check those out, be sure to follow the link below. Go check out Michael Ralt's new single. Check out his record. Check out his older records. It's all great stuff. Um, thanks for joining us. Glad, uh, glad to have you on. Thanks for having me. It was, uh, it was fun. I could probably do this again with a whole other five songs, probably. <laughs> now, that I'm, now that I'm getting to the end, I'm having regrets. But I think it was, it was really fun. I enjoyed it. Well, you heard it here. Next week, Michael Ralt back for round two. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for doing it. Uh, thanks to everybody for watching. Hit like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, all the links in the description. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.